Well, good morning. It's good to be back. Thank you to those of you who prayed for faith in me as we as we traveled. Uh, we were in western Kansas in a place called Pierceville. And uh, I, I have to admit that I had some trepidation going there. We were going to uh, Pierceville Federated Church on Avenue A East in Pierceville, Kansas. And it sounded a little... Uh, I don't know, hoity-toity to me, you know. And so, you know, not being a hoity-toity guy, just because you don't put whipped cream on an onion, I, I was a little concerned. So you can imagine my joy when we turned onto Avenue A East and discovered that it was a gravel road. <laughs> it was just, oh man, it was refreshing. And it was refreshing being with those folks. They have such a passion for for missions and for seeing the, the the last of the unreached reached, I was a little surprised to discover how much they knew about the unreached and how different they are from the unchurched. We're surrounded by the unchurched who have opportunities, who have access to the gospel here in the United States. Uh, but there are people on planet Earth who, who simply have no access, that that will not hear unless someone who has access, someone who is a follower of Jesus, goes there to that place, learns their language, understands the way they look at the world, becomes their friend, becomes incarnate there in that place, and and shares Jesus. So uh, it was a it was a really really good time for us, and uh, and thank you so much for the opportunity to go and uh, you know the privilege of of representing missions there in that place. We have been making our way, I noticed, you probably noticed that, uh, that we've been making our way through, uh, through the book of James in, in, a, in a continuing series entitled Advice from a Brother You Can Trust. And this is part nine, uh, which is entitled Look Before You Leap. And we'll be looking at James chapter one, verses 19 to 21, and the advice that James is going to give us there. So let's get started. Last week, or two weeks ago, I guess it was, we unpacked James chapter 1, verses 16 to 18, and we looked at that passage through the lens of the story of the fall, the story of how sin first came to the human race. We went there because there in the garden, Satan was fishing for a way to hook Adam and Eve and pull them out of their that place of rest that they enjoyed with God there in the garden. They were walking with him in the cool of the day and fellowshipping with him and talking with him and learning from him. And Satan, quite frankly, hated that. We also went there to that story because James was talking about fishing in the passage that we looked at two weeks ago. He helped us to see that fish usually choose a, a place of safety and, and hunker down. And, and I, if you're a fisherman, you know this. I'm not an expert on that sort of thing, but... Uh, the, the fish is, is hunkered down and staying safe, and the fisherman drops a lure in front of the fish, but the fish just isn't biting that type of lure for one reason or another. So the fisherman, fisher person, am I offending anybody by saying fisherman instead of fisher person? You know the really weird part? That occurred to me as I was talking about fisherman, and so just for fun, I typed fisher person into Microsoft Word, and it accepted that spelling. So I know I'm on the right track worrying about this, but if I end up saying fisherman instead of fisher person, it's only because I, I want to. The, the, the fisherman responds by dropping another type of lore, and another, and another, until he or she finds the, the one that'll catch the eye of the fish and get it to bite. That's what they're after. And that's an idea that we've been thinking through for several weeks now. But James is going to, James added a dimension to the discussion two weeks ago when he brought up the idea of deception. Satan deceived Adam and Eve by suggesting to them that it would be a good thing if they ate the fruit that God had told them not to eat. That's really the way he, he posited it for them. It would be a good thing to eat that fruit that God has told you not to eat. It's not going to be bad for you at all. Satan implied that God was just being selfish when he told him not to eat the fruit. He didn't want to share that fruit with them. And, and Satan also implied that God didn't want them to be like him. God didn't want them to actually bear his image. And that's why he forbid the fruit. And uh, I, I just I hope that we all understand by now that that was a bold-faced lie on Satan's part. 
He was lying when he said that. I say that because God's stated purpose for Adam and Eve and for all of humankind is that we would be like him and that we would bear his image. In fact, God says exactly that in counsel with the Trinity right, Trinity right before he created Adam and Eve. He says, let's make humans to be like us. Let them bear our image. And that, in fact, is why God was walking with them in the cool of the day every day. He was teaching them. He was teaching them how to be like him and how to bear his image. He was teaching them about himself so that they could mimic him. They could learn to be like him. And among other things, God was teaching Adam and Eve, we know because he was teaching them to be like him, he was teaching them to be as discerning as he is when it comes to knowing good and evil. God wanted Adam and Eve and, and all of humankind to be able to know when something was good or evil. He knew that we would need that information ultimately. But he wanted them to be able to, to learn that by the process of fellowshipping with him moment by moment and day by day. That was his dream. That was why he had created them. And that's why there in the garden, the ability to discern good from evil is the very thing that Satan goes after. It's the very thing that he focuses on. According to Satan's view, Adam and Eve didn't have to waste time every day fellowshipping with God and, and listening to him, which not coincidentally is something that Satan tries to convince us of every day. As he tells us that we can figure things out on our own and we don't really need God's input in our lives. We don't really need to listen to God. Satan told Adam and Eve that they could forget about God and, and learn everything that they needed to know, everything that they wanted to know, and they could shortcut that whole process by just taking a piece of that fruit. You remember the story. All they had to do was take a piece of that fruit and eat it. It was that simple, and it could be that quick. That's what Satan is offering. According to Satan, all they had to do is eat the fruit from the tree that God had told them not to eat, and their eyes would instantly be opened, and they'd be able to discern good from evil in the blink of an eye without wasting any time. And the really sad part is, is that Satan, that, that part that, that Satan said there, that they would be like God, they'd be able to discern, their eyes would be open, that part was at least in part true. Because as soon as they ate that fruit, their eyes were opened. And the first bit of insight that they gained, well, the scripture says that their eyes were opened and they suddenly knew that they were naked. And that hadn't been a problem the day before, the day before that, but now suddenly it was. And in my mind, that had to be the single greatest disappointment in all of history because they ate that fruit expecting this rush of wisdom, this incredible rush of wisdom, and all they got for their disobedience was the shame and fear that came from realizing that they were uncovered. And Eve sums it up so perfectly when in response to God's question about what she had done, she said, the serpent deceived me and I ate it. And that, puts us, that brings us right back to fishing. Because the fisherman drops one lure after another, right? But let's be clear here. The fisherman is not trying to feed the fish. <laughs> that's, not how, that's not what's going on there. He's not trying to feed the fish. Instead, he or she is trying to catch the fish. He's trying to figure out what it is that the fish will bite. He wants them to bite the lure, not eat the lure. And the way that he or she, the way that the fisherman goes about that, gets that done, is by making the fish think that the lure is something good to eat, something that will nourish the fish. In other words, and I, I hope you won't go home and cry yourself to sleep tonight if, you, if you're a fisherman, but the fisherman is deceiving the fish. That's what the fisherman is doing. Hey, hey, look, this is something you're going to want. No, it ain't. Not in the end, it isn't. The fisherman is deceiving the fish. Fish is just trying to get through the day, eating as much as it needs to be healthy and to survive, while all the while the fisherman is busy trying to get the fish to bite the last thing it will ever eat, like Satan did to Adam and Eve there in the garden. And he does the same thing to us every single day. He tells us that the thing that he's offering will ultimately be good for us. It'll be fun or it'll be exciting or it'll provide us with a much needed break 
from all the stress of the last few months. And despite the fact that we sense that Satan is lying to us, despite the fact that we sense that this thing that he's offering won't be good for us at all, we take the bait. We grab it and run with it. And that's why James is so careful to tell us that when temptation comes, we should hold on just a minute and take a deep breath and then cut the deception out of the temptation. In other words, we should look before we leap. Before you run after something, take a minute to consider. Take a minute to think about it. If you just take the time to look at the temptation, You'll realize that Satan has told you that this will be good for you, that this will feel good, that this will relieve the stress that you're feeling right now. But it's all a lie. Every last bit of it is a lie. And the really sad part is we know that it's a lie. We've already had enough experience with most of Satan's temptations to know that it won't be good for us or ultimately feel good. And it won't relieve stress, the stress that we're feeling. In fact, we know that giving into the temptation will only increase the stress and the angst that we're feeling because if we give into the temptation, we'll know that we failed in our pursuit of being like Jesus. We know that if we give into the temptation, we will have failed in our pursuit of being the person that God created us to be. We know all that. Because we've fallen for Satan's deception in the past. And if I'm just, I, I know I'm painting with a broad brush here, but if, if you're one of those people that, that, that has not, never fallen for Satan's temptation, never fallen for his deception, then please raise your hand because you need to be up here instead of me. I, I, I mean it. I, we've all fallen for it. He's deceived the whole world, Revelation chapter 12 says. We've all failed to cut the deception out of the temptation, and we've taken the bait. And every single time we've done that, all we've gotten out of it, all we've had to show for it, all we have left is regret and shame, just like Adam and Eve there in the garden, every time we fall for it. Now, there's one more dimension that we want to add before we get to unpacking the passage that we'll be looking at this morning. And to add to that, we we need to go back to our, our fishing illustration one more time. We'll be there several times this morning. But we've been saying that the person who's trying to catch the fish is really deceiving the fish. And he or she does that by dropping one lure after another. The fish takes a pass on the first three lures for whatever reason, and then when the lure it's waiting for finds its way uh, in, in, into the front of, in, in front of the fish there, the fish strikes. The fish hits the bait with such suddenness and such tenacity that you can feel the strike as you're holding the pole, and that's why you set the hook. You react to that by setting the hook so that you can reel the fish in. The fish strikes the bait without giving the situation much thought. Fish takes the bait without considering the possibility that it's being deceived. And it doesn't give a second thought about the possible consequences of falling for the lie that you were telling it at that particular moment. In other words, the fish doesn't look before it leaps. And I know it's a fish, and because it doesn't have legs, it doesn't have the capacity to leap. I get that. But more importantly, we know that, that a fish doesn't have the capacity to think. It just moves instinctively through life. So we have to give the fish a pass because it can't sort out the deception that surrounds that hook that you've dropped in front of it. And this is where we have to say, that's the fish's excuse for getting caught. But what's my excuse for all those times when I've fallen for the enemy's deception, even though I knew he was tempting me? What's my excuse? What happens to me when I leap without looking? Well, that's where James is going to take us this morning. So we need to get unpacking this passage. And we always begin the process of unpacking a passage by standing together and reading from God's word aloud together. And so if you would, please stand with me as we read James chapter 1, verses 19 to 21. Read it with me. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent. 
and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Thank you. We know that God always blesses us with his truth whenever we read his word. And I especially enjoy it when I hear you reading it back to me. The story that I plan to tell you this morning comes from the Gospels and recounts for us one of the, or a couple of the things that happened on the night that Jesus was arrested. It's not a part of the story that I included in the Easter story as I told you, well, as I told you that on Easter morning, but, but some of the story happened in the upper room, and so there's a bit of a disconnect, but some of it happens in the upper room, and some of it happened in the courtyard of the house of Caiaphas, who was the high priest in Israel at that time. In the story, Jesus is going to warn Peter about something. He's going to give Peter a very clear heads up. And Peter will have the chance to think the thing through and to make a decision to get it right. But please be listening for how he responds to Jesus' warning as he reacts to some very trying circumstances in his life the night before the crucifixion. And with that background, this is the story from God's word from Matthew chapter 26 and Luke chapter 22. Jesus was talking with his followers there in the upper room, and he took the time to tell them that a prophecy from Scripture would be fulfilled that very night. They were eating the, the Passover Seder meal together, and he said that the, the prophecy would be the prophecy that would be fulfilled was the one that foretold that God himself would strike the shepherd and the sheep would all be scattered. Jesus and his followers we're about to face some very difficult times. God was going to strike Jesus and the sheep, the followers, his disciples would be scattered. Peter responded to that in true form. We, know, we would expect that Peter would do exactly what he did that night. He responded to that by telling Jesus to, in, in no uncertain terms that the, that the others in the room, these other, these other chuckleheads might, might reject you. They might turn away from you. They, they might disown you, but I never will. And Peter went on to say there in that context that he'd gladly go to prison for Jesus and even be willing to die for Jesus if that's what was, re what was needed. In response to that, Jesus said, Simon, Simon, Satan has requested that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you. And when you return, strengthen your brothers. And that's when Peter said, Lord, I'm ready to go to death with you. I'm ready to go to prison with you. And in response to that, Jesus warned Peter. I tell you, Peter, tonight, three times you will say that you don't know me. And you will do all of that before the rooster crows early tomorrow morning. Not long after that conversation, Jesus led his followers out of the upper room, uh, out, out the eastern gate, down the Kidron, through the Kidron Valley and up under the Mount of Olives, the side of the Mount of Olives, where the Garden of Gethsemane was, because he desperately wanted to spend some time with his father as he looked for the strength to take on the challenge that was before him the, the, uh, to face the cross. After he had prayed, just to cut the story a little shorter, the, the, the men arrested Jesus and they led him away. They led him to the house of Caiaphas, the, who was the high priest that year. And Peter, in the meantime, true to his word, at least at this point, followed Jesus, but, but he kept his distance. Some other people that were there that night started a fire there in the middle of the courtyard and they sat down together to see what would happen. This was a pretty eventful evening as as Jesus, this rabbi, this Messiah, according to some, was on trial. And uh, Peter sat down with that group around the fire. A female servant saw him there in the firelight. She looked closely at him and then she said, this man was with Jesus. He was, he, he was with Jesus. And Peter replied instantly, woman, I don't know what you're talking about because I'm telling you, I don't know that guy at all. That's what he said to her and to the group. Having said that, Peter got up and wandered away from the fire and went to stand nearer to the gate, the, the, the gate that, that opened out into the city from the courtyard. 
he went there to stand by the gate, and, 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 and while he was standing near the gate, another servant girl saw Peter and recognized him. She said to the people who were standing there, this guy, this guy right here, he's one of the guys who was with Jesus of Nazareth. He's, he's one of his followers. And then she turned to Peter and she said, you're one of them. No. Peter replied, I'm not. And then he swore an oath that he didn't even know Jesus. And about an hour later, another person spoke up and confronted Peter in front of the entire crowd, in front of the whole courtyard. This guy must have been with Jesus, the guy said, maybe from one of the other groups. He added then that, that you can tell from his accent that he's from Galilee, just like all of the other followers that, that Jesus has brought here. Peter replied, man, I do not know what you're talking about. He denied knowing Jesus again, and he punctuated his, his denial again by calling down curses on himself and then going into a rant, and he got loud. And that was when, just as he was shouting this third time that he didn't know Jesus, the rooster crowed. And at that very moment, Jesus was being moved from one place to another in, in, in the house of Caiaphas, and Peter saw him. And that was the moment that Jesus turned and looked right at Peter. Can you imagine? And Peter remembered what the Lord had said to him just moments before, it seemed. The rooster will crow very early in the morning, Jesus had said. Before it crows, you will deny three times that you know me. Peter, realizing that and catching that look from his friend, his savior. He ran from the courtyard and wept bitterly. And that's the story from God's word. I want you to remember that before I told the story, I asked you to note how Peter reacted and responded to the events of that evening. Jesus had taken the time to warn Peter that there'd be three tests of his loyalty to Jesus that very night. And Jesus added that Peter would fail all three of those tests. So Peter had the opportunity to walk into that situation that night with his eyes wide open and his heart fully aware of the consequences of falling prey to what Jesus called Satan's request to sift him like wheat. But whenever I read the story and tell the story, it strikes me that Peter was really quite impulsive and apparently didn't give much thought before he moved or spoke. This, this impulsiveness is something for which Peter is famous as you make your way through the Gospels. He's not, be, he's not known for being someone who took a thoughtful approach to life or, or anything else. Remember, Jesus had said that Satan had requested to sift Peter like wheat, and that reminds me of what happened in heaven the morning that Satan asked for permission to test Job. You remember that story? We looked at it two and three weeks ago. Yeah, Satan asked for permission to test Job to see how Job would react to catastrophic loss. We've been talking a lot lately about reacting and responding. And it's time that we, that we put the capstone on the difference between those two things. We said all along that reactions are immediate. We normally react without thinking, but responses usually take time. I have to think through how I'm ultimately going to respond to this, even though I may have reacted in a different way. Some of us, of course, choose to stay in the reaction mode, and because of that, well, we end up wasting our sorrows. We waste our sorrows anytime we don't learn the lesson that God has built into the trial because no trial ever comes without, without God's intention of teaching us a lesson. But if we take the time to think and then choose a response instead of just knee-jerking it, choose a response that fits the situation, a response that's indicative of pure joy, in case you haven't heard me say those words before in, in James, if we do that, we'd find that the trials that we face and the sorrows that come along with them have deep impact on our lives. They change us for the better, not for the worse. They build us. They don't destroy us. Remember the story of Job. As we tell and hear that story about Job, it can seem like he only had time to react to the trials. But it can also seem like he didn't have time to think through his response. The trials that came into Job's life that day came without warning 
There was no warning that this was going to happen. The total loss of everything he held dear washed over Job like a, a tsunami. And Job, after receiving that awful news, one, you remember that phrase? And as he was speaking, as he was still speaking, one after the other, Job is just hit with this blitzkrieg of trials, unlike anything that any of us have ever experienced. And after Job receives that news of, of total loss, Job says nothing. Nothing. So it's true that Job didn't have time to think about how he should react or respond. But the remarkable thing about Job is that he made the time to think about how to act, react, and respond. You may remember from the story of Job before he said anything at all, he tore his robe and he shaved his head because that was the traditional way of showing grief. But think about it. In the time that it took him to tear his robe, and shave his head, Job made the time to reflect on all that had happened. And as a result, Job's first response was to worship. And when Job finally spoke, he said, the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In other words, Job both reacted and responded to that tsunami of trials. He reacted with deep grief as any of us would if we were faced with the crushing loss that Job faced that day. But then he took a moment to reflect, to think about what had happened. And then he chose to respond with worship. He didn't have the time to think about how to respond, so he made the time to think about how to respond. And considering the tsunami of trials that washed over him, Job's response is absolutely incredible. Job took the time to think, and then he praised the Lord for both giving him all that he had had, and he praised God as well. He praised the Lord as well for taking it all away. And the end of Job chapter 1 ends with those amazing words. In all of this, Job did not sin by making God guilty, by accusing God of doing something wrong. Having said that, I'm absolutely confident this morning that that Job was tempted to respond by absolutely losing it. There was grief in his heart. There was deep sadness in his heart. And having said that, I have to say that I'm equally sure that there was anger in his heart. Some of the, some of the loss that he had suffered had come from wind and, and from lightning, but others came from, came from the Sabaeans who came in and stole, took things away from him. He had to be angry about all of that. But in the heat of the moment, Job didn't let that out. And this is where conventional wisdom tells us that Job was emotionally unhealthy. You'll hear it. Job was emotionally unhealthy for keeping things bottled up the way he did. But he didn't keep things bottled up. He kept his deep emotion in his heart, and he considered how best to respond in a godly way to the situation, considering how he felt about it. He thought about his situation. And then when he finally did respond, his response brought glory to God. And the fact that Job took the time to think through his response, while Peter merely reacted in the moment without taking the time to think, helps us to understand why things went so right for Job and so wrong for Peter. Peter reacted without thinking, but Job made time to think about his response, and that made all the difference. And that brings us back to the fish we were talking about earlier. The fish stays in its place of rest and security where it could live happily ever after, but this fisherman that's standing in that boat wants to invite the fish over to his house for supper. That, that, you know, that's really what he's about, and the fish might not catch all the nuances there that you just caught, but that's what the fisherman's after. So he drops one piece of bait after another, but the fish remains in its place of safety. And then comes the moment when that right piece of bait appears before the fish. And in that moment, without thought, the fish strikes at the bait. And it's soon in the boat on the way home to supper with the fisherman. Now, we don't want to pretend that the fish can think or that they have the ability to consider. I'm not saying that. Fish react instinctively instinctively to everything that they see and hear and sense. And, and that's probably a good thing because if fish were more thoughtful and more careful, 
we'd never be able to catch them. I think God has designed them as idiots that just, anyway, we don't need to go there. And that should say something to all of us today when trials come into our lives. Because those trials are followed immediately by God's soft prompting that we respond with pure joy. And if you haven't experienced it before, if you've been here for, for our studies in James, you know that that's what God is after. He's after pure joy. Consider it pure joy because you know. You know the outcome of trials. You know what those trials are going to do for you, but you have to think that through. The problem is that at the same moment, Satan's temptation follows God's soft prompting. And Satan's temptation often is much louder and much gaudier than God's soft prompting. Satan suggests that we respond in any way other than pure joy. That's the one he doesn't want us to respond with. He doesn't want us to look like Job. He prefers that we look like Peter. Any way that you can get this done, anything other than pure joy. He suggests that we react with fear or that quick bit of anger or that deep sadness. And then we have an opportunity to take a moment to reflect. We have an opportunity to begin to think through what's happened and to wonder how we should respond now that we have reacted. Hey, you suppose it's possible that if we learn to take those thoughtful moments, if we learn to take three deep breaths before we respond, do you suppose it's possible that that by itself would prevent us from falling for the deception that's built into the temptation? If you just stop and think. Do you think it's possible that if we were to take the time to think things through before we respond, that perhaps we'd learn over time to respond in the way that God wants us to respond instead of responding in the way that Satan and our old nature want us to respond? I think that it's entirely possible that if we'd, we'd learn to think things through first, we'd begin to get things right. Because that, in essence, is what James says next. Look at verse 19. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. I literally love the way James approaches this here. He says that we should, first of all, be quick to listen. In any situation that we find ourselves, we can be sure that the Spirit of God is right by our side. Now, it's quite natural to be frightened when frightening things happen. It's natural to be sad when sorrowful things happen. It's natural to want revenge when someone has taken advantage of us. But if we'll take a moment and be quicker to listen than we are to speak, we'll hear the Spirit of God whispering to us to help us to know how to respond in a way that brings glory to God and is good for us and everyone that we love. Unfortunately, having faced something difficult or harsh or sad or frightening, most of us are presently in the habit of pulling our phone out of our pocket or our purse and, and jumping onto social media to complain about the events of the day. That's, that's where we go. We react and we respond all in the same instant without even thinking. We want to know that other people are aware of how difficult things are for us right now. We want their sympathy. We want their understanding. But we forget that the Spirit of God was there as the situation began to develop, and he's still there now. He's seen everything that's happened, and he has some advice for you and me in every situation that we face. He'll prompt us to respond in a way that'll strengthen our faith and make it more valuable. But sad to say, we don't always take the time to listen to the Spirit of God or the advice that he gives. And that's because we're too busy talking. As we draw other people into the injustice that we just suffered. Think about it. That's exactly what happened to Peter the night, that night in the courtyard. He responded and spoke without thinking. So we can just keep going through life without ever pausing to think things through, or we can make the time to consider the consequences of our response. And think about this. What if we were to start listening to the Spirit of God before we decide to speak. What if we were to talk to ourselves about that anger that we feel and choose a response that, that reflects pure joy rather than a response that reflects anger? Uh, to paraphrase Casting Crowns, uh, what if the family turned to Jesus and stopped asking Facebook what to do? 
What if? If we could learn to insert that pause to think at that moment, then we'd be able to respond in a way that brings glory to God and is good for us and everyone that we love because we will have learned the lesson that James is asking us to learn this morning. We'd be able to prove that we've learned the lesson that everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. So when trials push us out of our place of rest and into open water, we have to learn to stop thoughtlessly striking at the bait that Satan has dropped in front of us. We have to learn to think before we respond. And with apologies for mixing metaphors, we have to make sure that our brain is engaged before we put our mouth in gear. We have to learn to look before we leap. So let's just say that we're, we're all learning to respond in ways that bring glory to God. Let, let's just imagine that for a moment. And, and, and it seems to me that if we were to learn to respond in a way that brings glory to God, that God benefits from that. But we're the ones who end up paying the price for that. In other words, when I respond properly, God gets glory from that. What do I get? What do I get out of that? Well, I want to assure us today, this morning, that, that every one of us from time to time find ourselves in a situation where we react with fear or worry or anger or deep sadness, but we have to learn to think of fear, worry, anger, and deep sadness and emotions like that as rocking chair emotions. When I say rocking chair emotions, I'm, alike, I'm likening those reactions of fear, anger, worry, deep sadness to just sitting in a rocking chair. When you're sitting in a rocking chair, rocking back and forth, there's all kinds of movement, but no progress. We sit in our worry, we sit in our fear, we sit in our deep sadness, we sit in our anger, and we go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And at the end of the day, we are still in the same place where we were when we began the day. Rocking chair emotions. I believe that's why James says what he says when we add verse 20 to verse 19. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. And again, I love what James does here. He doesn't say human anger does not produce the righteousness that God requires. He says it doesn't produce the righteousness that God desires. He's on your side. He's looking for this from you. He knows that it's the best thing for you to react like that. James is, is trying to help us understand that some of our reactions are actually pointless and do more damage than good. We may react with fear or worry or anger or deep sadness, but when we hold on to any one of those things, we can be sure, listen to me, we can be sure that we are not making and will not make the progress that God wants us to make, that God has planned for us to make in the midst of the trial. And that's what James means when he says that human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. So what are we supposed to do with this? Well, true to form, James has some advice about that as well. But before we get to verse 21, it's kind of grayed out there. Uh, let's try to put all of this together. God sends trials into our lives. He, he does that not to punish us or because he doesn't like us, but because he's seen great value in our faith. And he wants to purify our faith and make it more valuable. So he sends the trials. And by his spirit and through his word, he immediately gets busy helping us to know how to respond. This is how it goes down for me, how it goes down for, for you and for all of us. He shows us the way to pour joy, pure, pure joy. He points in that direction and he whispers to us and he urges us to follow him. Come with me. I'll show you the way to get there. But in the heat of the moment, we all tend to react. We're scared to death. We're scared to death or, or we're so angry we can't breathe or we retreat into deep sadness, or we can't help but worry about how all this is going to turn out. And all of those reactions are perfectly natural, but that's when the Spirit of God gets busy in our lives and prompts us to set aside the way that we are reacting and replace our reactions with a response that will help us grow. 
He suggests that we change our fear into pure joy. He suggests that we change our deep sadness into pure joy. He suggests that we turn our worry into pure joy. He suggests that we let go of our anger and respond with, well, by no, now we should all have picked up on the pattern of how God works in our lives when we face trials. Pure joy. That's what he's after because that's what's best for you. The sad part is we aren't always quick to listen to the Spirit of God. We aren't always slow to speak. We don't always take the time we should to to think about how to respond. And in the meantime, Satan is busy as well. And I can tell you from experience and from God's word, but experience primarily that he doesn't waste any time. And he, he doesn't say to himself, well, you know, she's been through a lot today. So I think I'll leave her be and let her recover before I attack. He doesn't say, well, he's had a really tough day. So I'll just, I think I'll just let him have a good evening with his family and so that he can learn to breathe again before I close in on him tomorrow. Satan cuts no corners. He takes no prisoners. He gives no quarter ever. He's out to destroy you and what you believe. And he sees every trial you face as an opportunity to get that done. Satan has taken note of the trial. And he's seen our inappropriate reaction. And quite frankly, he loves it. And he wishes that we'd stay there for as long as possible. He loved it the night that Peter repeatedly reacted in exactly the same way. Satan doesn't want us to grow in spirit. He doesn't want our faith to be strengthened. And he doesn't want our faith to grow more valuable. So he provides us with an alternative in the form of temptation. Listen to me. He is not out to feed us or to nourish us. He's out to take us home for supper. He'll suggest that we go out and get drunk or that we start looking for a way to have an affair or that we remain in that place of deep sadness for a week or more or that we just let go and have that holy hissy fit to which I'm entitled. Or, well, once again, name your poison. And we're in the midst of that inappropriate reaction. As we're in the midst of that, Satan doesn't waste any time. He begins dropping lures in front of us. And just like the fish that we've been talking about, we strike the bait without considering whether or not we might possibly be being deceived and without giving any thought to the consequences if we bite this thing, if we fall for the lie that we're telling ourselves at that moment, that we are telling ourselves at that moment. And the lie that we tell ourselves, well, we tell ourselves, we pick up on Satan's song. We sing the next verse. We tell ourselves what Satan has been telling us. I tell myself that I've had a really hard day, and now I come home, and that woman sitting over there who seems so so peaceful and gentle is cleaning my clock. You know, she she uttered those words as I walked in. We need to talk. The, the, the most terrifying words in the English language. I've had a really hard day. I've been talking to people and fighting with bears and bulls all day. And, and now she wants to talk. She's cleaning my clock. And I tell myself, listen to me. I tell myself that I have the right to react in any way I want to because of all the mess that I've had to deal with all day, only to come home to my wife who is adding insult to injury right now. I tell myself that, but it's time to to come to terms with the fact that that's a lie. I am not entitled. I may have reacted during the day with anger or fear or worry, or I may have been in a place where I could couldn't uh, where I couldn't react like that because other people were watching me. You know what that's like. You're able to control yourself when you're talking to your boss, but somehow not when you're talking to your kids. Uh, I, I, I made, they, they were watching me, and so I couldn't react the way that I wanted to. But now that I'm home with faith, uh, suddenly I feel perfectly free to react any way I want to. And also, I reserve the right to hold on to that reaction for as long as I care to, at least until the football game is over. But the truth is, I don't have the right to hold on to that reaction. And I don't have the right to respond any old way that I want to when I've had a difficult day. I have to take steps to deal with my inappropriate reaction and response And in my thinking, it's vital that I do that. Listen to me. It's vital that I do that before I come home to hurt my family. You know, there's a stupid joke that I use every time we've set up tables out there in the front porch uh, for an event. And and now the event's over and it's time to, to, to put the tables away. 
uh, when we start into that process, someone will always ask, do these tables go in that front closet up there in the, in the gathering place? And, and I can't help myself. I always say the same thing. No, the tables don't go there. You have to put them there. You know, we, we've, we've had long afternoons where we just wait for the table and they, they and, and I know it's a dumb joke, but it speaks to a deeper need than my twisted sense of humor. It, it, it's, you see, there are things in all of our lives that aren't going to go away, no matter how long we wait. There are things, there are some things in our lives that won't go away. We have to put them away. And that's exactly what James says in verse 21. He thinks of our inappropriate reaction and responses. He thinks of our anger and our deep sadness and all of those other rocking chair emotions as things that are incredibly damaging to us. In fact, right after he says that we should be slow to be angry, he says that human anger never produces the righteous life that that God desires. And right after he says that, he refers to human anger and all of those other rocking chair emotions and reactions by using a couple of terms that that some of us will find surprising and maybe even offensive. He calls all of that, he calls all of that moral filth and prevalent evil. It's everywhere you turn, he says. Because I I may start the day, we have to think about what he said, because I I may start the day with a smile on my face and uh, clean and crisp and, and by choosing inappropriate reactions and, and illegitimate responses, I may end the day as dirty and stinky as a human being can be. And that's why he says what he does in verse 21. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that's so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. The trial has come and we've reacted quite naturally. We've had that moment of anger, that moment of worry, that moment of fear, that moment of deep sadness, or that moment of of however it is that you respond at a time like that. And it's at that moment that the Spirit of God begins whispering to us. It's then that the Spirit of God begins to plant God's Word in our hearts. It's then that the Spirit of God begins seeking to save us from the mess of our inappropriate reactions and responses. It's then that the Spirit of God begins prompting us to choose a response that will strengthen our faith, pure joy. And at the same time, the enemy has dropped that bait in front of us that he expects will pull us away from what the Spirit of God wants us to do. And at that moment, it's up to you and me It's up to you and me to simply say no to the ungodly, unhelpful responses that Satan has suggested and to say yes to the Spirit of God because that is the only way that we'll ever learn to lay aside that old way of thinking and living that corrupts us and hurts everyone that we love. That is the only way that we can come to the place where we've set aside moral filth and prevalent evil. And I hope this morning that you've been quick to listen. I hope the same thing for myself as I studied this passage this week. I hope this morning that we'll be slow to speak and slow to anger and slow to argue with the Spirit of God when he prompts us to do the right thing and respond with pure joy. I hope that rather than getting angry, rather than worrying, rather than being afraid or deeply sad, we'll instead choose pure joy as our response when trials come. I hope that we'll lay aside all the mess and muddiness and stink of the ways we typically react and allow the Spirit of God to save us from all that so that we can choose to end the day as crisp and clean as we were when the day started. In other words, look before you leap. In closing, let me read you the passage that we've been unpacking this morning. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Will you stand with me in the presence? Father, once again, it feels like it's taken a long time to say some things that are are really quite simple. God, I, all we can do on a Sunday morning is, is tell your truth. That's, that's all. Now, all I can do during the week as I'm, as I'm learning is discover your truth. You tell us the truth, God, and then it's up to us to apply that truth to our lives. 
God, that's the next place that we're going in the book of James. And so I, I pray that you'd get our hearts ready for that. But, but in the meantime, Father, help us to react in a, and respond in a way that, well, that brings glory to you. And just as importantly, help us to react and respond in a way that's good for us and for everyone that we love. We ask you these things in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen.